Hey guys, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, who came here to the far east? Somewhere far, far away. What, where? Stillwater, Minnesota. Minnesota, all right. Olympia. Oh, good. All right, brother. <laughs> Anybody else even want to chime in? I think that's about it. California. California, great, great, great. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> all right. Appreciate you coming out, Minnesota and uh, Cal um, Columbia, and also, um, of course, California. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, you know, this is the uh, CBDI, uh, CBDI Mastermind event, and what I want to say right now is this: that um, we're very, very thankful for you coming out. And if you look at, if you look at the stories out in the marketplace right now in the news, what you'll mostly see is that you see like problems with Tilroy, problems with uh, Corona. Um, uh, canopy, uh, MedMen. Um, I'm from Tennessee, so um, right uh, north of us is uh, Gen Canna. Uh, if you in Colorado, the biggest guy out there for CBD is uh, Mile High. What's the pattern you see for everybody? Chapter eleven. Chapter eleven. Good, good. She's very, very. She, she must be the uh, lawyer here. Right? So, so yeah, chapter eleven. People like decreasing uh, um, workforces. So, across the industry, across the industry. What you see is you see systemic problems, right? And then one journalist will talk about this, and one journalist will talk about that, but what they'll say pretty much is that they'll say irrational exuberance occurred, and people overbuilt, they only cared about headlines, they didn't really care about profits, they didn't care as much about other things, right? And what I want to tell you is that um, who in here has been in, uh, um, who in here knew in the, uh, him, CBD market. You? All right, anybody else? A couple more people? A couple more people? Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. So what I want to say is this, that a lot of us, um, whether it be <laughs> any type of market you're, you're, you're involved with, a lot of times you'll think, man, this thing is growing so fast, why even get started? Does that make sense? Because it's already past me, right? Just like uh, me, I'm out of uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, I'm a co-packer. For six years, people have been asking me to co-pack CBD iterations. I said no. I said no until the hemp bill passed two Decembers ago, right? And what I want to tell you now is with the news coming out, it's actually really good for you. It's actually good for every one of us. Every one of us in this room right now who really cares about the plant, really cares about the consumer, really care about pioneering and doing good for the entire ecosystem. And that is what CBDIA Mastermind is all about. Does that make sense? Of, of aggregating a tribe of people on whatever you're in, whether it be farming or cultivation, genetics, uh, extraction, um, um, uh, researching cannabinoid science, getting out there and co-packing, getting out there and doing formulations, whatever it is, you know what? You've got to align yourself with the right tribe. That's why you see people coming in from Minnesota. That's why you see people coming in from Columbia and California because we're all trying to find the right tribe. Does that make sense? Because you can't do this by yourself. You just can't do this by yourself. There's so much going on in innovations in the marketplace and also there's a lot of fake news. So you gotta find the right tribe to align yourself with so you can collaborate and do the best that you can within your uh, ecosystem and also climb very, very quickly to help the consumer at large. And that's the essence of CBDIA, right? And that's why you're here today. This is the first organization as codified curriculum and terpenes and flavonoids and CBD. And this is one of the pioneering gentlemen that's uh, gonna be talking about it very, very soon, all right? Right after me. And also what you need to know is that when you join in the CBDIA, you become a tribe member, you get access to uh, additional professional services at discounted prices, you get access to magazines, that's premier distribution all across the United States, you get access to discounts on other CBD events that's held by uh, Mace Media that is really concentrated on awesome specialists coming in, awesome knowledge that's coming in, and what you got is you're gonna have a fountainhead of knowledge, of cannabinoid knowledge and also industrial news that you can assimilate and you can trust. That's what CBDIA is all about, all right? And without further ado, we got Dr. Adam uh, Abilene. 
And let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I've met a lot of doctors in this industry, a lot of doctors in the industry, all right? Dr. Adam not only is a consummate doctor that's voraciously just, you know, reading all different types of cannabinoid news, but you can see he's combining, right, gastrointestinal and also um, um, cannabinoid science and seeing how it affects so many patients that he deals with. But this guy, he's actually gone to Israel too and, and met Dr. Mishulam. If you don't know Dr. Mishulam, you should know Dr. Mishulam because uh, I think, what, 50 years ago, 60 years ago? Yeah. Uh, he was the first. Yes, yes. In, the, in the 60s, yeah. In the 60s, yeah. okay? He was in it way, 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 way before us was, was hit to be in it, right? And, and he was the first one to isolate out THC and CBD. And he sat there going, what the hell is wrong with the world? This is a really powerful vital, uh, molecule and it's going to do great things. But it took like 50, 60 years before legally changed, mores of society changed and everything else changed, right? But Dr. Adam has gone worldwide to research and to connect with belly to belly with pioneering scientists all around the world to find out what absolutely works and where we need to go. So without further ado, Dr. Adam, come on up, brother. I'll, I, I'm so excited to hear you speak. Everybody hear me okay? Uh, I don't know if this mic's uh, loud enough, but I'll try to speak speak loudly. So, uh, well, welcome for welcome for joining us. Um, you know, I'm very excited to be part of the Cannabis Industry Association. I've been working with the association now for a little over a year, and this organization is really the one that I decided to align myself with because there's lots of conferences, there's lots of expos out there currently. And what has set this, um, it, this event differently is, is the mission. You know, the mission is not just to make sure that consumers uh, and patients are receiving the best products out there on the market that are the safest, but also that it is driven by the best science. Because there is, as George mentioned, a lot of fake news out, out there when it comes to this stuff. And it's the fake news which has really gotten us into trouble and a lot of people in trouble in, in the industry. It is really, in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's slowed down the progression because you know there's been a lot of mistakes which have, which have been made. Um, the other thing that's great about the, the, um, uh, uh, this organization, um, I love how George referred to it as a tribe leader, all tribe members. I don't know who's, who's the tribe leader? I guess that's what we'll have to figure out next, but I love that term. But you know, really, this is a this is a family. This this uh, association's a family, and you know, you're all you're all part of it. And we are um, committed to making sure that you are being given not only the best science, but the most advanced and up to date science. And we have multiple different venues by which we're doing that, and platforms by which we're doing that. Because I can tell you, I I, I study this stuff all the time. And I come home at night and, and I look at my desk of the 10, 20 new articles which were published that day. And, and every day it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So keeping up with this science is, is, is paramount. And that's one of the things that this association um, is, is really dedicated to and uh, is certainly a passion of mine. So um, I'm going to talk to you about... Uh, you know, so br briefly about myself, I'm going to talk to you about cannabis for gastrointestinal diseases and cancer. But I want to, but I want to talk to about you this in, in the context of a few different things, not just about the health aspects that cannabis has for the GI tract, but right now this is can 
cannabinoid medicine for GI health is a huge opportunity in this market from a from a from a from a an ability to help patients and consumers who suffer from a variety of GI conditions but to this date it's really been overlooked and I will tell you the importance of the GI health cannot be overemphasized and what we've learned about the GI system with its relationship to the endocannabinoid system is, is tremendous and our ability to influence the GI tract and GI conditions <coughs> with the use of cannabinoids um, is real and I'm going to share with you, you know, my experiences with that and um, hopefully you'll get some good take home uh, messages. So, you know, briefly about myself, um, I'm the current CEO of uh, Adirondack Gastrointestinal and Colorectal Surgery. I come to you from uh, Lake Placid, New York, much colder than it is here. Um, I am the Chief Medical Officer of, uh, and I'm co-founder of Reserve MD. I have my own line of CBD products as well as other health and wellness products. And I currently am um, the uh, Chief Medical Officer of the Cannabinoid Industry Association. So you'll see here, this is my kind of, uh, you know, day-to-day -day life, um, you know, where I'm operating on, on patients and, and it's been a very interesting um, uh, experience for me over the past several years where I go from this environment where everything is so science-based it is so highly regulated. You can't get a patient into that operating room without, you know, you know, dotting 20 I's and, and crossing 20 T's and making sure that everything's in line. Um, and every medication you see being hung here, what the, what the anesthesiologists are doing, all these, med, all these instruments we're using, go through years and years and years of testing. And then I go to the office, then I go to the office, and I start talking to patients about things like gummy bears and, and marijuana or can cannabis cigarettes. And, and so, which again, the, the, the science, although it's growing, is nowhere near, you know, what it is for traditional medicine. But this is what's making it very exciting. And, and that's part of my mission is to, to bridge that gap. And when, I, and when I started out, it used to be seen as a... I used to have this arrow as a one directional arrow, meaning I would treat patients with, so I'm board certified in general surgery as well as gastrointestinal surgery, and my specialties are in GI cancers and inflammatory bowel disease. And what I used to find is that cannabis used to be used as a palliative effort. So I would diagnose somebody with end stage cancers and things of that nature or, or, or really horrible conditions where our conventional medications or surgeries didn't work. And so then we would start turning to things like this. Well, now I reverse this arrow because I will tell you that through the use of these medications, I've been able to keep people out of here, which I think most people would like to stay out of the operating room as much as possible. And so my, my, my journey began uh, right around 2010, shortly after I finished, uh, completed my, um, all of my training. And I moved to upstate New York, and, you know, which is a pretty rural area, and I developed and inherited a large portion of patients with severe debilitating gastrointestinal conditions. And as most, um, I'm sure you've all had doctors and several that you get along with and several that you say you don't really see eye to eye on. Well, I think I've you know, um, done a good job of developing this good physician-patient relationship because I want patients to be honest with me. And eventually, after a couple years, people would come back to me and say, hey, you know what, doc? Thank you so much for all these medications you've been putting me on, but I have a confession. I haven't been taking any of them for the past two years. Oh, well, that's great. Your disease is curing itself. They're like, no, cannabis is curing it. And I said, huh, that's very interesting. So, um, so, and this was something that, that kept, uh, it was a recurring theme that just kept continuing. The problem that it left me with is it left me with this, what I call as my cannabis medical dilemma. And that is that I could not explain to my patients why it was working. I said, is this just placebo or are you just wanting to get high and you don't want to pay for your medications, whatever the case may be. But 
but these patients were truly doing well. So I knew there was something to it. So uh, at that point, I made it a mission to try to figure it out. Um, and again, as, as George mentioned, you know, I spent time traveling, you know, around the world, meeting with scientists and researchers to find out if there was some some reality to this. Because um, it took me almost three years to tell my parents who supported me going through very traditional medical training to, to, to let the cat out of the bag that I was also involved in cannabis medicine. And uh, I was very nervous telling them that, but, uh, but once I was prepared to show them the science, it was good. But, but, um, but really what I had to do is I had to be able to provide my patients with, with real life information of why this may be helping their disease, okay? But more importantly, in this area, in this, in this era, I should say, where there's such a stigma associated with it, I had to be able to prove to my colleagues, medical professionals, people who were trained, you know, the classic, um, you know, uh, allopathic, you know, root of medicine, um, to say, listen, there's validity to that. And, you know, I'll tell you, it was a struggle. I got lots of criticism in my community uh, for doing this. And, but over time, through education, I was able to, you know, actually um, prove that this is, this is a, uh, that was a good thing. So, um, you know, so one of the, one of my efforts, you know, I went to, uh, you know, I went to Israel, spent time in the Multidisciplinary Center for Cannabinoid Research, met, uh, had the opportunity to, to, um, to meet and work with Dr. Raphael Meshulam, as well as his, uh, his group of, of uh, very um, smart, intelligent, bright um, um, scientists. And this is the Hebrew University there, and, uh, Medical Center. And, you know, um, even by U.S. standards, this is an enormous and an excellent medical facility. And this doesn't project here, but it's, I believe it's this building right here is a six-story building that's dedicated to cannabis science. And this is where all of this started. If it wasn't for this, for Dr. Raphael Meshulam and and this right now, we probably wouldn't be sitting here um, today. And um, you know, so the one thing that's intriguing is that you know this is a picture of Dr. Uh, Mashulam and myself uh, about a year and a half ago, and this is a picture of him, which you know is is uh, we, we've estimated it's somewhere you know in the 70s. But look at what he's right talking about here on the board: cannabidiol. Was anybody here in the United States talking about cannabidiol in the 70s? No. It's definitely not, right? So you want to talk about a pioneer, this guy's a pioneer, and his stories are, are amazing. Uh, talking about how he used to, you know, he had friends in the police department, and he would be able to get a little bit of that cannabis to go study. <laughs> and then, you know, he got in trouble, but then he went, he went to the legislators and said, I'm doing this for particular reasons, and he really battled for something, you know, that, that he believed in. So, um, we, you know, we commend him for that. We currently have over 2,000 medical cannabis patients, in our practice, I'm still a full-time surgeon, um, but uh, and and we've had about a 65 to 75 percent success rate. And defining success with cannabis treatment is very difficult, but we've we've um, defined it as having continued use, uh, decreased opioid or pain medications, decreased nausea or medications for chemo-induced nausea, uh, decreased epileptic events, and the biggest one is quality of life, which is something that you can't measure, okay? But when patients come back to you and they say, thank you so much for this, um, to me, it's like, you know, whether their symptoms are better or not, I know I improved their quality of life and, and we can't underestimate the value of that. What, the other thing that is extremely important to point out, because, you know, here we are at a CBD, exp we're at a you know, CBD uh, conference, is that what we found is that about 20% of our few thousand patients did not want THC in their products. And lots of reasons for that. You can imagine some is the stigma. Some is that it's just, you know, they, they didn't want the high. They couldn't go to work. Um, they also didn't want to test positive for THC. And depending upon, you know, which, uh, you know, profession they are, where we are, I work with a lot of professional um, uh, Olympians. I work with a lot of professional Ironman triathletes, and these are individuals who absolutely cannot test positive for THC. Right? There's there's no way. I mean, and so um, we wanted to make sure we made good products for them. And 
But the other thing I'll point out is that, that they prefer THC products. And by preferred THC products, I mean preferred non-THC products and preferred CBD alone because they said it worked better for them. So, and, and again, although you know you say 20% is not a lot, I, what I'll tell you is that of these 2,000 medical cannabis patients, I'm seeing the sickest of the sick. I'm seeing patients with terminal cancers, people who are on such high opioid uh, doses, people with very severe, severe conditions that, you know, we do know that, you know, when it comes to those extremes that, you know, THC does have, have some value, but, but CBD just continues to hold tremendous um, potential. Um, so, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be covering, you know, the, 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 the GI system in relationship to the endocannabinoid system and, and ways that we can actually harness the, the, energy, the, the power of the cannabis, the cannabis plant in order to, to enhance this. But, um, but again, the one thing that I want to emphasize and I want everybody to think about in this room is that right now, pain is a huge, huge, huge component to cannabis uh, health or to improving um, you know, the health of individuals with suffering with these conditions. Um, one thing that is frequently overlooked though is the GI system. And I think there are tremendous opportunities um, uh, to be able to, the, to harness um, uh, cannab cannabis medicine for a variety of GI conditions. And the reason being is that I'm going to show you just how important the endocannabinoid system, the role of the endocannabinoid system plays for a variety of for, for a variety of GI conditions. So we'll be talking a little bit about the anatomy and and um, what we call the GI uh, gut uh, brain access, and um, talk about our gut microbiome. You know, we're all familiar with bacteria and, and good bacteria in our gut, how important it is, but also that there's a very um, there's, there's a very unique role that, that the endocannabinoid system plays with the gut microbiome as well when it comes to the health of our GI system. I'll talk very briefly about you know, some specific ailments and cannabinoid for, for, for cancer. So what is the, br the brain-gut access? Well, if you look at it, you know, you've got your brain up top, you've got your spinal cord, which sends all these nerves down, and then it goes into a, the, the intestinal nerves and then from there, there's chemical messengers, and a lot of these chemical messengers involve the endocannabinoid system. But the brain-gut access doesn't just involve our GI tract, as what we think of as our intestines. It also involves our other organs in our body, our liver, spleen, pancreas. We know that endocannabinoids, one of their jobs is, the endocannabinoid system is to um, provide a state of homeostasis and to keep our organs healthy. So that way, if our immune system may not be functioning properly, the endocannabinoid system can help put that back uh, in, into check. So if you look at the intestinal uh, anatomy, you know, you, you've got, and the reason I point this out is because I'm going to show you there's several different targets. You know, this is the, the lumen, uh, you know, the actual channel, if you will, of the gut. And within this, you've got the lining of the gut, which is our, one, our, one of our first main defense mechanisms. Of, the, of anything that we consume. No matter what we put in our mouth, unless it's been uh, surgically sterilized, it's gonna have bacteria, bugs, all sorts of stuff in it. We know that, right? But why, does it not, why do those things not make us sick? Well, some of them are just non-virulent, so they're not gonna attack our body, but the, the stomach acid, as well as the, the immune system with our GI tract is, is, very, is, is responsible for protecting us from that. Now, we also know that the endocannabinoid system is involved with nerves and um, neurotransmission, as well as secretion of different fluids and enzymes within the GI tract. So there's all these targets along here where the um, GI tract is tremendously rich in the components of the endocannabinoid system. Um, this is just a little bit of a closer look of the small intestine. Um, And if you look at the, you know, a, a really close up or a microscopic view of the small intestine, you'll see all these little, um, what we call villi, which are all these little surface projections, which increases the surface area of our gut. You know, if, if we could lay out our gut, and they were saying that it would cover a football field, 
with all these with all the lining. So that's a huge um, receptors which are densely um, found throughout the, the GI system. And the endocannabinoid system, again, its role is to provide homeostasis. So together, uh, the cannabinoid receptors help in help maintain this intestinal mucosal barrier to prevent pathogens from coming into our body and attacking us and making us less less healthy. But the other thing that that uh, the endocannabinoid system does is it controls our intestinal secretions and it controls our intestinal motility. For example, there is a, a group of conditions now which are referred to as endocannabinoid deficiency syndromes. And what that means is our body produces our own natural endocannabinoids. And um, one of the theories behind something like irritable bowel syndrome is that people with irritable bowel syndrome, where they get spastic bowel, they get intermittent diarrhea, constipation, bloating, things of that nature, a lot of it has been shown to be linked to an inadequate endocannabinoid system in what we call endocannabinoid tone. Our body produces its own natural endocannabinoids, and we have to have a proper tone in order to maintain homeostasis so we don't have too much inflammation, we're able to fight infection, things of that nature. And the endocannabinoid system does this through multiple um, ways. You know, one is through neuroprotection. It protects the nerves of the GI tract. It modulates our immune system. It helps protect our cells from destruction, what we call cytoprotection. The other thing is a lot of people think of the immune system as just fighting infection, right? But what I want to emphasize is that the job of the immune system is to survey for abnormal things in our body. Now, besides infections, what are other abnormal things in our body that we might want our immune system to identify and kill? Cancer, right? Which is why people who, have, who are immunocompromised or are on medications that compromise their immune system are at increased risk for a multitude of different cancers, okay? And the endocannabinoid system within the gut also helps regulate metabolism, nutrient transport, energy storage, and it regulates um, how our, um, our intestines, um, uh, the motility of our intestines and how they function. So if you look at the endocannabinoids in our brain and how they affect our GI activity, our endocannabinoid system is involved in the modulation of food intake, okay? Centrally, you know, we, we, ha we eat food, we, get a, we have a food reward behavior, and there, at some point there needs to be a signal that says, okay, I've had enough reward, I don't need any more food, so to prevent, you know, um, overconsumption. And peripherally, the endocannabinoid system plays a role in the action of how our liver cells, our fat cells, as well as our pancreatic cells function. <coughs> So diabetes, for example, a condition you know, where the pancreas doesn't work properly, can be associated with inflammation and, and insulin resistance, the endocannabinoid system also plays an important role in that. And then further up in the brain, we know that the endocannabinoid system plays a role in, in the function of our of hypothalamus and our pituitary glands, which actually help um, regulate metabolism throughout our body. And if you look at the receptors found within the, within the GI tract, first of all, the CB1 receptors are, are, are densely distributed in the nerve. We know that CB1 receptors are primarily found in the brain, spinal cord, and in nerves. Well, the ner there are more nerves in the gut than there are in the brain. So if we're using um, cannabis-based therapies for different neurologic conditions and nerve conditions, which we are, then there is no reason to think that this should be any different for the nerves of the intestinal tract. And they're co-localized, these nerves are co-localized what we call uh, choliner chol cholinergic nerves, and these control all the activities of our GI tract. And then they also control the, the sensory nerves. So the, the nerves within the GI tract our, um, our pain fibers in our GI tract are different than the pain fibers in our skin. So for example, if somebody, if you, if someone were to cut your skin, you're going to say, oh, that, that really hurts, 
right? But if I could find a way to magically jump into your belly and cut your intestines, you wouldn't feel that. What they feel is their, their nerve fibers are triggered by stretch and contraction. Stretch and contraction, which is why if you get a stomach ache, you get a GI bug, you get all that cramping, that's what hurts. And so the, the, the endocannabinoid system controls that kind of motility, which is one of the reasons why it's been shown to be effective for people with irritable bowel syndrome and other GI conditions where they have um, spastic intestine. And this, the, the, so the CB1 receptor, when they're activated, they actually decrease intestinal motility. The important, so you say, well, that's good, right? If, if you suffer from a diarrheal condition, right? Well, then this would be a good thing. The, one of the counter arguments was, uh, which would have been brought up a while back, is, well, if you slow down the GI tract, are you gonna push people into constipation? And the interesting thing is that it's never been shown to be true. Um, for some reason, it, 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 the, the endocannabinoid system is less effective at controlling the motility of the colon than it is the small bowel. But I don't think that's a bad thing because it allows us to, to capture the effects of the endocannabinoid system on the GI tract to slow down motility without inducing, causing another problem such as constipation. And activation of the CB1 receptors also decreases uh, gastric acid secretion. In this day and age, the medications that we're using for um, uh, antacids and for heartburn and reflux are being associated with lots of different problems. Are you familiar with a group of compounds called protein pump, I'm sorry, proton pump inhibitors, um, you know, protonics, Prilosec? Well, over the past several years, we're learning that these medications may have significant side effects in the long run with, with regards to osteoporosis, increased GI, uh, functions and even kidney problems. Um, so, you know, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to potentially harness the, the, these, these effects of decreasing acid, gastric acid secretion. And then, again, since the same way we use <coughs> cannabinoids for pain, well, we know that it can actually decrease the sensory pain signals within, within the gut for the reasons, uh, you know, that I mentioned. The gut is the first line of defense, okay, of everything we put in our mouth, okay? And so, we, and for that reason, not only is the gut very rich in the endocannabinoid system and nerves, but it's highly rich in all of our immune cells, our neutrophils, our eosinophils, our macrophages, T cells, B cells. They have to fight the stuff that we're putting into our system, okay? And so the CB2 receptors have been found in the immune cells of the gut. Um, the CB2 receptors, when activated, decrease inflammation, uh, decrease tissue damage, decrease intestinal motility, and decrease the sensory pain signals through multiple mechanisms. And one of the biggest ways that it does this is by cooling inflammation. I treat patients with inflammatory bowel disease, which include Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. For those of you who aren't familiar with those conditions, they're autoimmune conditions where our body attacks itself and causes excessive inflammation, okay? So you can imagine that if we are able to decrease inflammation, well, it's, been, it, it's gonna be beneficial for these patients and a large percentage of our patients, particularly those who have problems controlling with some of our other conventional medications, are all on cannabinoid therapy, or a large portion of them are, and with very good uh, success. So, when you look at inflammation, so the human endocannabinoid system does, we know, we know it plays a role in inflammation. And we, it's also been shown that an unhealthy endocannabinoid system leads to excessive inflammation. Now, how would you say somebody has an unhealthy endocannabinoid system? Well, there, are, there have been studies that have shown that they can measure levels of our natural endocannabinoids within our bodies. And some of these people will have deficiencies in these endocannabinoids. So the whole idea of introducing plant-based cannabinoids, what we call phytocannabinoids, is to, <coughs> is to act as a supplement, right? You know, if we're deficient in iron, what do, our, what do our doctors tell us to do? You need to take iron. If you're deficient in vitamin D, what do you take? You take vitamin D, and this is a similar idea. 
Now, eventually, right now, we don't have great ways. As a doctor, if you come into my office, I can measure your endocannabinoid levels to determine your tone, but we're probably not too far off from that. And my suspicion is, and my hopes is that within a few years, we'll be able to look at this and say, hey, you've got this GI problem. I'm gonna test your endocannabinoid um, so within, I'm gonna test your natural endocannabinoids and other compounds to determine your endocannabinoid system and say, are you deficient in this or not? And if so, I would love to be able to say, you're a great candidate just for cannabinoid therapy as opposed to me putting you on some of these medications mm -hmm. with significant side effects. If you're familiar with the medications we use for things like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, they're all immunomodulators. They're what we call biologics. And they, when they work, they work. But I think anybody, if given the choice of using that, those medications versus another plant-based medication, which could do the same thing, would choose to do that because the side effects of these immunomodulating um, uh, medications, which the whole idea is to blunt your immune system. Well, when you blunt your immune system, what happens? You're more prone to two things, infections and cancers, okay? So, and there's several ways that cannabinoids um, can, can <coughs> bind to our immune system and decrease inflammation. One is that they block, the, they block the enzymes which break down our natural endocannabinoids. So, for example, we've got our natural endocannabinoids floating around in our body. The two main ones are anandamide and 2-arachidonoglycerol and what we call AEA or 2-AG, okay? Now, those are those molecules which we want to be able to be in a good concentration in our body to be floating around to, to controlling levels um, of inflammation. However, some people have overactivity of the enzymes which break those down, so they become deficient in them. Or they may just not produce enough of them. So one of the ways that you could do that is say, well, if you can't produce enough of it, why not focus on something that's going to block the breakdown of them? So therefore, you're naturally going to increase your natural level of endocannabinoids. And that is one of the main ways that, that, that CBD um, is, in particular, CBD is beneficial. We also know that CBD and other cannabinoids will decrease the release of chemical messengers these chemical messengers are pro-inflammatory mediators, meaning they just will continue to drive inflammation. And the problem with these inflammatory mediators is a lot of times they become, it becomes a snowball effect and it becomes very difficult to, to actually control. The other thing is the endocannabinoids um, within the GI tract will decrease um, the production of what we call reactive oxygen species or reactive nitrogen species. Now these are, what we call you know, a free radical species. And what they do is they can actually go and they can cause inflammation and tissue destruction. But more concerning than that is that these have the ability to actually go destroy our DNA. And when you destroy DNA, that's when you end up with genetic alterations, mutations, and potentially things as other diseases and cancers. So we talked, uh, I talked briefly about this before, about cannabinoids and intestinal pain. As I mentioned, bowel distension, inflammation, and contraction are the main triggers for pain, okay, within the gut. And it's also uh, something that I, I, I like to frequently comment is that, is that pain is not pain until it reaches the brain, right? So you can, you can, you can have something happen on, on your hand, you get a cut, but you know what, we're not going to have any understanding of that unless that signal gets sent to our brain. Now, one of the things that cannabinoids do is they help blunt that response. They blunt that response by, through multiple mechanisms, but one of the ways they, they, that they do this is by decreasing the release of excitatory neurotransmitters. So the same way that people, that, that, that patients are using CBD for seizure disorders, well, why is that? Well, it's to calm those nerves down, which is the same way, the same reason that endocannabinoids and CBD help for things like anxiety. Okay, so if you can slow down this this signaling, you can actually decrease that 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 pain um, uh, response, and they can also. Um, uh, and again, there's several locations to block the pain pathway. One is at the nerves, with all the nerves within the, within the gut itself, but then also traveling up, up the spinal cord. 
And cannabinoids can block pain pathways also by slowing down the communication between nerves, which I talked about. And one of them is through glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And CBD can help decrease the release of these excitatory um, neurotransmitters. Um, there's other ways that CBD affects pain, generally, but also within our, within our gut. One is through its interaction with CB1 and CB2 receptors. THC uh, tends to have a high affinity for binding to these receptors, where CBD weakly binds to these receptors. Now, does that mean it doesn't work with CBD, with, with C cannabinoid receptors? And the answer is, no, it doesn't mean that. The way that CBD works on our CB1 and CB2 receptors is something called allosteric modulation. Now, what that is, is that normally you have a neurotransmitter which will bind to a receptor in kind of a key and lock fashion. So it fits in perfectly and it triggers a response. Now, what CBD does is that it can bind to these receptors at what we call allosteric sites, which are different sites on that receptor, and it changes the configuration of the receptor to make it function differently. And this has implications of, of how it's to work. Now, we also know the role of serotonin in pain and inflammation, uh, particularly in regards to the, to the GI tract as, as well as other um, pain conditions. But, act, but CBD and other cannabinoids do interact and, and um, activate our serotonin receptors. And they also work on a group of receptors called vanilloid receptors. Now, vanilloid receptors are what we call these TRPV um, receptors. The whole idea be behind these vanilloid receptors is that when they are activated, um, whether it be through pain, heat, acid, it'll cause the nerves to fire. Okay? But what happens when you add cannabinoids is it actually desensitizes those. Because if you keep hitting those, those, um, those um, um, receptors, eventually it turns them off. So people have overactive, these trip V receptors that keep sending signals for pain and inflammation and this and that, where if we can then, one of the things we know CBD does is that as you add that, it'll, it'll keep triggering that, but eventually it stops it and it desensitizes it and takes the pain away, which is one of the main theories of why CBD is, has been shown to be successful for this. So, so CBD is an, is, is an anti-inflammatory. Uh, it increases the level of our natural endocannabinoids by blocking the enzymes which break them down. But it also competes with what are called fatty acid binding proteins. Now, the, what that means, what fatty acid binding proteins, our body produces its own natural endocannabinoids, which I mentioned that are very important for maintaining homeostasis within our body. In order for those endocannabinoids to be broken down, they have to bind to what we call fatty acid binding proteins, then they're brought into the cell where then they're destroyed. So when you add CBD and other endocannabinoids into this area, there's only so many fatty acid binding proteins. So CBD is going to bind to some of them, which is, which is going to then cause competition for those fatty acid binding proteins. So now our body, the fatty acid binding proteins are only able to pull in some of our natural endocannabinoids, thereby leaving larger amounts of our natural endocannabinoids within our system, which are very beneficial as well. So when you look at the data on this, you know, there's, um, from a GI standpoint, there's, um, this, this comes from the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, published in 2017 which is a good reference right now um, as far as understanding some of, some of the, the science, but in that, they looked at, 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 at pain conditions. And of that, there were 28 randomized controlled trials, 16 quality systematic reviews, 21 research articles, and they looked at varying routes of administration as well as varying illnesses. So clearly that's you know, a flaw of the study, but, but this, these are a whole bunch of smart people at um, the National Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine. And based upon this, they have concluded that there is substantial evidence that cannabis is an effective treatment for chronic pain in adults. Now, again, this is from a GI standpoint, and we can't be going and necessarily making any medical claims about this, but this is put out by an authoritative 
body that, that this was their conclusion. Doesn't mean we can make these claims, but certainly adds significant support to our efforts and what we're doing and what we believe um, the relevance of cannabinoid dark. And as a surgeon, I will tell you that cannabinoid medicine is creeping in every day. More and more studies are talking about um, cannabinoids for um, pain, but also from a surgical standpoint, as well as the terpenes found within cannabis. We currently, there was a study um, that was published that looked at the amount of pain medications, opioids, that individuals who underwent gastric bypass surgery required. And what they did is they randomized them into having um, traditional morphine, uh, fentanyl, whatever the post-op pain medication may be, but then they supplemented with aromatherapy with terpenes. And what they found is that the amount of opioids was significantly decreased. So this points to the power of plant-based medicine. And, and, you know, so now the next step's going to be is to get people in to utilize, you know, to be able to do some studies on post-op pain patients use, using um, cannabis. The next is the gut microbiome. And this is where, again, I believe there's a huge opportunity um, in, the, in, the, in the cannabis space and in the CBD space um, because... You know, and, and I may be partial as a, as a gastrointestinal surgeon focusing on GI conditions, but there, I do believe there's a tremendous opportunity in the market to really start to look at this from a GI standpoint because people think of the GI as just our guts and, and, and how we're able to digest food and nutrients, but the GI tract and our health plays an integral role in our overall health. And the endocannabinoid system also it contributes to that significantly. So what I typically say is that, you know, healthy gut bacteria equals a healthy GI tract equals a healthy human. And that has been shown in multiple different reasons. And, you know, it's, it's a result of decreased inflammation, enhancement of our immune system. And the endocannabinoid system plays a key role in the interaction between the bacterial responses. So what do I mean by that? Well, our body, when we're introduced, when we introduce bacteria into our GI tract, our body has to be able to identify that as saying, oh, this is just an innocent, you know, bystander, we'll, we'll let them go by. Or is it a pathogen that we need to attack, okay? Now, once it finds these pathogens that it, that it has to attack, it has to be able to attack it in, a, in an appropriate way that is not that is just enough to kill the pathogen, but is not enough to cause more inflammation and more damage. You know, and this is, this is what happens with autoimmune conditions, inflammatory bowel disease, um, such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. What we know with, I, with inflammatory bowel disease now is that what, it, yes, it's an, it's, it, we're inherently have that as an autoimmune condition, but it's how our body sees these bacteria. So somebody with Crohn's disease may see a particular bacteria and say, oh, I don't really like that, so I'm gonna cause inflammation, but because of the autoimmune condition, they, they just cause excessive inflammation. So that's where the endocannabinoid system's job is to say, tone it down, and that's why we've had so much success with our, with our patients with inflammatory bowel disease as well as other GI conditions such as irritable bowel syndrome, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and other just general intestinal conditions because of the roles that the, that, um, the delicate balance that exists between the endocannabinoid system um, and, the, um, uh, and, and, the, and the bacteria in the GI tract. So if you have an unhealthy GI tract that's inflamed, you're prone to this thing called leaky gut. And people have heard of this term, leaky gut. Well, basically what this means is you have, an, you, you have this barrier, which is supposed to protect us, and if it's not healthy, meaning you don't have a healthy endocannabinoid system to help protect us and maintain homeostasis, then, this, then the junctions between these cells here, what we call these tight junctions, they become 
non-functional. So therefore, bacteria and toxins will, um, will leak into our bloodstream and cause more systemic effects, okay? So therefore, again, you know, uh, unhealthy inflamed cells or poor intestinal microbiome can lead to destruction of the connection between cells leading to leaky toxins in our system. And so again, it's the job of the endocannabinoid system to say when it sees these offending agents in our guts, which can be bacteria, viruses, but could also be stuff that we consume that we probably don't want to be consuming, whether it be heavy metals or you know pesticides or whatever the case may be, which could trigger inflammation. It's the job of the endocannabinoid system to say, let's, let's enhance our immune system to take care of it, but let's also make sure that our immune system doesn't get out of control. So there are a, a fast, when, when it comes to leaky gut, and again, this is you know the other huge advantage that I see in the future um, as a potential for um, you know opportunities for for you know GI um, products and uh, you know <coughs> utilizing um, cannabinoids um, in the future because a fast growing number of diseases, including multiple autoimmune diseases, are believed to be a result of the changes in this tight junction, meaning meaning this leaky gut. And the cannabinoids have been shown to downregulate the release of chemical messengers, what we call cytokines, reactive oxygen species, which are associated with, with increased inflammation leading to breakdown of the healthy gut barrier mechanism, okay? Um, in my practice, you know, here are some of the main things that I, that I, I, I see. Um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, GERD, uh, gastrointestinal reflux disease, colorectal cancers, cirrhosis, and obesity and metabolism. The one thing that we can say is that the cannabinoids are very effective at treating um, appetite as well as um, um, uh, nausea, particularly chemotherapy-induced nausea. And it does this through different mechanisms. One is centrally by helping um, mediate um, the response that we have up here that tells us that you know, we're, we're, we're nauseated, but then it also acts at the intestinal level because the intestinal level is what's sending the signal to our brain to, let's say, vomit, for example, okay? So if you can cool stuff off down here with, with endocannabinoids and you can cool this off up here, then people will have less, you know, nausea and vomiting. Um, a couple of side things is that, you know, uh, is that, you know, roots of administration, we always, you know, have to be mindful of if people are having, you know, just diarrhea that's uncontrollable, you know, first of all, they should see a, a, a GI specialist first to make sure there's nothing else going on. Um, but but when we're, when we're dealing with individuals who have GI conditions, you know, if they're having such severe diarrhea, one thing you have to be mindful of is whether, is what the route of administration is gonna be best. You know, taking a, a pill or a capsule or something, I've had people who have said, yeah, I took it and I saw it in the toilet 20 minutes later and said, well, that's not very, that wasn't very effective. So that's where we look for things like, you know, tinctures um, as well as even, even vaping products. But, you know, again, the National Academy of Science and Engineering has stated that there is conclusive evidence that oral cannabinoids are effective anti-emetics in treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. But anecdotally, um, and based upon the best science, you know, I feel very comfortable saying that it does work for these particular conditions. Irritable bowel syndrome, there have been only a few randomized controlled trials um, which we need more of, but what these randomized controlled trials have shown to date is that it's been associated with decreased abdominal pain and decreased frequency of bowel movements. The one thing I will caution is that if you're looking at products that are, that <clears throat> are specifically for GI conditions, you have to be very careful with terpenes, okay? Terpenes, we, we, we study our products, uh, you know, having thousands of, of patients, they're, they're great for us to be able to they're very willing to test our products. Um, and the one thing that we've found is that as we increase these terpenes, we're actually finding people having significant GI distress as a result. 
So, you know, we had to tinker with that. So it's just something to be mindful of, you know, when you're looking at products is to understand, you know, what terpenes are in these and also how much is too much, okay? Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, um, animal models uh, over and over again um, have shown um, that CBD has been shown to decrease um, uh, inflammation through the activation of multiple receptors, including uh, CD2 receptor, tryptophan receptors, and our PPARs. And, and right now, currently, human models, uh, there have been outcomes in multiple non-randomized controlled trials showing benefit, but we definitely need some better trials to do that. Um, uh, last thing here we'll keep going through is the use of it for cancer. Um, you know, I, I, this is something, unfortunately, I deal with on a frequent basis, and then people will come to me and say, I want to use cannabis for my cancer. And there's several reasons we use cannabinoids for cancer, both as a pain agent, chemo for, for nausea, um, as, a, as a potential chemotherapeutic agent in and of itself, depression, anxiety, and then just improvement of life. Um, we talked about nausea. The one thing I'll say is that right now is that cannabis has been shown to be very effective for nausea. And the one thing of note is that it's been shown to also be decreased with uh, decreased side effects compared to some of the others. And cannabis as a chemotherapy, I won't bore you with this slide, but basically the same mechanisms by which our conventional chemotherapy agents produced by Big Pharma um, work. We're also showing now that cannabinoids can interact with those pathways as well. And so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a promising future for that as well. So it's been shown to be promising for different types of cancers, but remember, we cannot make any claims yet. And, even, and um, but hopefully over time, we'll get some more information on that. So our gut is um, a major target for cannabinoid therapy. Um, you know, I, I go to conference after conference after conference, and you know, we're talking about very important things, particularly in this age with opiates and, and pain and things like that. But I think it's gonna be very important for us to really start to spend some time and to really understand the role that the endocannabinoid system, as well as providing products which can interact with our endocannabinoid system unique to our GI tract. Um, this is just gonna, this is gonna be very important. Um, as I mentioned, we're learning that gut health equals human health. And so we want to focus on, you know, the gut health, which, which CBD and other cannabinoids are a great opportunity. So I apologize, we're running a little short of time. I'm gonna, I'll be happy to take questions. If not, I will be around uh, the next few days. You're welcome to grab me at any point in time.